Lord of Mysteries, Chapter 515, Harvests for Everyone. Frankly speaking, although Alger had predicted that Miss Justice wouldn't bargain, and the fact that the mystical item was indeed worth about 5,500 pounds, he still felt a strong sense of discomfort over such actions. It felt like after all the hard work he had put in to make a killing, the money he earned wasn't even more than her pocket money. 675 pounds split from the world, and the artisan's fee is only 600 pounds. I'll earn a net profit of 400 pounds. I've made a total of 1,075 pounds in this transaction. But the world isn't a simple figure. He has a great deal of Beyonder characteristics and potion formulas, and he's involved in a great number of events. He's in the know of relatively important information. It's not worth it to get into a conflict with him over a few hundred pounds. Otherwise, I could have pushed the price of his Beyonder characteristic to below 4,000 pounds. The hanged man thought wistfully, as the fool rejoiced at the prospect of receiving 3,825 pounds. Derek looked at the lady across him and earnestly said, Miss Magician, your spirit eater's stomach pouch is ready. Excellent. Frizz heaved a sigh of relief. I'll pay 300 pounds in cash to Mr. Hanged Man. Upon hearing this, Alger's spirit was also lifted. He hurriedly requested the fool sitting at the end of the long bronze table for permission to conjure the potion formula. A few seconds later, he wrote the Solar High Priest formula onto the yellowish-brown goatskin parchment in front of him. Sequence 7. Solar High Priest. Vain ingredients. One comb of a dawn rooster. One fruit of a radiant spirit pack tree. Supplementary ingredients. 100 milliliters of a dawn rooster. 10 drops of sun essential oil. 8 grams of fingered citron powder, and 5 grams of solidified lava. Although Klein didn't deliberately pry into this potion formula, the content which was conjured thanks to him was still reflected in his mind. As long as he was willing to use dream divination to recall, he would immediately get the corresponding knowledge. He couldn't help but exclaim, indeed, being a platform is most profitable. Derek received the piece of parchment expectantly, glancing at it with relief and excitement. Then, he conjured the list of monsters which were found in the area surrounding the City of Silver, letting the hanged man pick out the Beyonder ingredients that would be used to level the difference in prices. Alger calmly and carefully checked the list, gaining a precise understanding of the situation around the City of Silver. After that, he selected three ingredients that he knew had buyers and prices. After that, I'll be able to sell them within two days, earning me about 1,000 pounds. Counting the 300 pounds from Miss Magician and the previous 1,075 pounds, I'll finally have enough money for the dragon-eyed sea condor's eyeballs. Feeling exhausted, Alger turned his head to the side and said to Fors, Miss Magician, you can prepare the transaction for the dragon-eyed sea condor eyeballs. The hangman had less than 20 pounds on him at present and even the artisan fees he had paid in advance was borrowed thanks to his wide network of contacts. However, by the end of the transaction, his cash assets would reach £2,375, sufficient enough to cover the £2,000 required for the main ingredient. For his thought of the loss she had suffered last week at the hands of Mr. Hanged Man and responded, feeling slight grievance, all right. For her, how much this deal would eventually earn her would depend on her teacher, Dorian Gray. She wouldn't earn anything extra beyond what he was willing to share with her. At the end of the transaction segment, Klein manipulated the world to seek to purchase the remnant spirituality of ancient wraiths and a pair of eyes from a six-winged gargoyle. As for the sale or process of making the murloc bladder into a mystical item, he temporarily didn't intend to do it through the tarot club. He wished to use it as a catalyst to expand his social connections and resource channels at sea. After today's tarot gathering, Miss Justice will finish gathering her psychiatrist potions ingredients, and the same is true for Miss Magician's Trickmaster potion. Now that Little Son has the formula, he can finally work towards Sequence 7. He's one step closer to providing me with a way to remove the mental corruption inside a Beyonder characteristic. Mr. Hangman is about to receive one of the main ingredients of Wind Blessed, so there's only one last obstacle in his way before reaching Sequence 6. Only Imlin hasn't yet made up his mind or found a solution. There's no hope of him advancing in the near future. Klein looked around and said with a chuckle, continue your free exchange. Audrey was about to say something out of habit, but when she thought about it carefully, she felt that there was no news to share this week. Apart from the numerous balls I've attended and the two psychology classes, there are only matters regarding my return to East Chester County that can be talked about. But there's no need to. She pursed her lips and remained silent. Fors, who was still in her languid state from the New Year's holidays, continued having a blank mind. She commented, feeling rather guiltily, 
Backlund is still under the same kind of high pressure as before. Don't take any risks unless you're an official Bayonder. Is that so? Emlyn, who had been behaving well during this time, frowned doubtfully. A vampire like him who led a routine lifestyle couldn't experience the pain of having all the Bayonder gatherings stopped. The hanged man nodded and thought for a while. Then, he said to the son, don't be careless, before holding a sacrificial ritual. It's best if you confirm that the chief who led the exploratory team isn't in the City of Silver, or if he's busy with other matters. Mr. Hangman, do you mean that the chief could have noticed the repeated cycle of fate? Derek asked in astonishment. The hangman replied solemnly, that possibility can't be ruled out. However, I can't be sure since I don't know enough about your City of Silver. Having said that, he hid his smile and presented a serious expression. Derek said with chagrin, there are many things I'm not sure of either. Alger sighed inwardly, eliminating his disappointed emotions. In short, caution and carefulness will allow you to live longer. Thank you for your reminder, the son said sincerely. The hangman withdrew his gaze and said with a smile, recently, the sea has been relatively calm. No, that's just what you think, Klein silently retorted, manipulating the world to speak with a hoarse voice, I just happened to hear about something at sea. Without waiting for the hanged man to ask, he looked at Justice and the magician. Ladies, can you buy me a radio transceiver? I can give it a try. Fors agreed without paying too much attention. As she was about to leave Backland, Audrey could only say sorry. After negotiating this deal, the world cleared his throat and said, That matter has something to do with the Church of Storms. Something to do with the Church. Why didn't I receive any notice? Is it not required for them to pass it down to people at my level? The hangman frowned and waited patiently for the world to speak in detail. The world originally wanted to sweep the hanged man with a teasing look, but due to the difficulty of those sequence of actions, he could only regretfully give up. With a heavy and hoarse laugh, he said, an old custom in Banzi Harbor was revived. Some of the inhabitants became heretics, and even a bishop of the Church of Storms was corrupted. I heard that the matter has been resolved, but quite a few people died. Banzi Harbor, Alger recalled the situation of the area and explained to Miss Justice and the others who remained confused. There's a custom of living sacrifices there and the target is an evil spirit called the God of Weather. Overseas, in the southern continent, there are quite a number of such evil spirits. On the surface, it seems like they've been cleared away, but in reality, they continue living in a strange state. Many people have suddenly died in those places. Ha <laughs> ha, it isn't necessarily because of an illness. If you guys have similar travel or adventure plans, don't be careless. Alger tried to describe what had happened in Banzi Harbor as an accident, one that was within the realm of understanding. Suddenly, he heard rather deep laughter. This laughter came from the end of the mottled long table. Mr. Fool. The hanged man suddenly turned his head. Mr. Fool. Banzi Harbor isn't as simple as it seems. Audrey immediately looked at Mr. Fool who was sitting upright on his high back chair. Noticing looks of puzzlement, curiosity, or excitement, Klein laughed leisurely with a hint of reminiscence in his voice. This reminds me of a king of angels. A king of angels. The matter of Banzi Harbor involves a king of angels. Audrey's eyes widened in anticipation of what Mr. Fool was to say next. A king of angels. Frizz took a deep breath, her expression somewhat bitter. Why is it that all we talk about at the tarot club is the descent of the true creator, the awakening of the primordial demoness, and the reappearance of a king of angels? I'm only a sequence nine. She wanted to look up at the sky and sigh. Emlyn, on the other hand, felt a baffling sense of excitement, having found another reason for why his ancestor had gotten him to pray to the fool. As expected, this is a gathering of messiahs in preparation for the apocalypse. We are the chosen ones who will gradually face evil existences such as the king of angels, the primordial demoness, the true creator, and so on. Emlyn had an impulse to immediately agree to the deal proposed by the hanged man. But the fact that he had no money had ruthlessly crushed the fantasy in his mind. Which king of angels will it be? In a rare occasion, Derek joined in with the conversation with Miss Justice and the rest. A king of angels. What secret is Banzi Harbor hiding? Alger was waiting for the answer with rapt attention. Seeing that Mr. Fool didn't plan on continuing, Audrey couldn't help but ask, Honorable Mr. Fool, which king of angels is it? Klein leaned back in his chair chuckled and said, Medici, who established the Rose Redemption. His descendants live in Binzi. Rose Redemption. The King of Angels related to the true creator. Audrey didn't expect that the matter would be multi-layered, with each layer more serious than the last. She subconsciously asked, Binzi. That's the old name of Banzi. Alger replied in a low voice as he clenched his hands. He could no longer imagine the truth behind this matter. 
he only knew that the unforeseen event in Banzi Harbor might not be over yet. The danger that could devour people remained lurking in the shadows. He didn't know much about the phrase Rose Redemption, only knowing that it had something to do with the Temple of the True Creator and the Angel of Fate, our robber Rose, but was unable to confirm exactly what it represented. In short, the level of this matter is beyond my imagination. Alger looked at the end of the long, mottled table, and suddenly the thought flashed through his mind that Mr. Fool really did know the Eight Kings of Angels and that he knew many secrets. At that moment, he thought of something. Just last week at the gathering, Miss Justice had inquired about the other Kings of Angels, and Mr. Fool's answer was that we will come into contact with them in the future. And just a week later, we really have come into contact with a new King of Angels. Mr. Fool had foreseen this. Alger's pupils shrank as he lowered his gaze in fear. Chapter 516 the Hanged Man's Guess Amidst his shock, another doubt surfaced in Alger's mind. If Mr. Fool had foreseen this, why did he mention that Banzi Harbor's matter is related to Rose Redemption and the King of Angels, Medici? Did he tell us on purpose? He hopes to spread this matter through us. The target is the King of Angels, Medici. No, it's more likely to be the true creator. Mr. Fool has repeatedly thwarted the plans of the true creator before, so it should be no exception this time. The term Rose Redemption appeared in the abandoned temple of the true creator, and it's established by the King of Angels, Medici, and Auroboros. Clearly, they share a deep connection with the true creator. Banzi Harbor only has our Church of Storms, so the person Mr. Fool is really informing is actually me. Alger vaguely understood something. Then, he became acutely aware of another problem. The last time the world mentioned that something major was about to happen in Backlund, it was immediately confirmed by Mr. Fool and it later involved the awakening of the primordial demoness and the descent of the true creator. This time, the abnormality at Banzi Harbor also received a response from Mr. Fool. He revealed the secret hidden in ancient Binzi and has brought the Rose Redemption and the King of Angels to the forefront of all the members of the Tarot Club. Isn't this tea too coincidental? Yes, news provided by the world previously had to do with Backland, and this is the first time it involves the sea. Furthermore, Mr. Fool had mentioned last week that his adorer has been forced to leave Backland because of the great smog. They match perfectly, so, the world is actually Mr. Fool's adorer. No, he should be a representative among all his adorers in the Tarot Club. He's to do things that Mr. Fool finds inconvenient. Of course, through this gathering, the adorer will also trade goods and knowledge in order to advance himself. This is also considered a form of Mr. Fool's nurturing of him. On careful thought, this theory is probably correct. At least, the world has never collected Roselle's diary in exchange for knowledge or intelligence from Mr. Fool. As his adorer, it's his duty, so he has probably submitted them in private. From this conclusion, some deliberate questions or contradictions on the world's part are meant to conceal his identity as an adorer. This is consistent with his experienced, skilled, and cunning character. In addition to the hidden attempt to awaken as he slowly lifts the seal, Mr. Fool holds the tarot gathering to also use us to interfere in certain events. This is evident from the composition of the members, a high noble, a bayonder at the bishop level of the church, a survivor of the forsaken land of the gods, a student of the Abraham family, an adult vampire. Each of us represents a faction or a particular circle or resource channel. Many thoughts flashed through Alger's mind. Not only was he not repressed by his own guesses, but he was also excited. To him, Mr. Fool's unknown purpose was the most frightening thing. Having an initial understanding of what he wanted to do allowed him to effectively avoid any risks and improve himself by doing so. As long as the Fool wants to use us to do things, he'll definitely give us some benefits. This is exactly what I was hoping for. Otherwise, I don't know when I'll be able to see the hope of becoming a demigod. Ha, huh, the world, you definitely didn't expect that I would see through your disguise. Alger's fear subsided, and he began to think about how to use the information about Banzi Harbor. He couldn't report the matter just like that, as it would arouse suspicion, and he had to patiently wait for an opportunity to let the higher-ups appreciate him and reward him, without ending up being monitored. Audrey could tell that Mr. Hangman was undergoing a mental exercise, but she didn't expect him to come up with so many guesses in such a short period of time. And from the words of Mr. Fool, she was delighted to learn that Rose Redemption was a secret organization established by a number of kings of angels, which was also related to the true creator. At the same time, she vaguely sensed the strangeness of the world. She realized that this member of the organization, who was the most difficult to read, was always involved in important matters and could always obtain important information. 
Furthermore, he constantly produced formulas, ingredients, and Bayonder characteristics, as if he could successfully hunt down a Bayonder within one to two weeks. He left Backland and went to sea. Or was it a rumor he heard in Backland? Should I tell this information to the church? Well, Mr. Hanged Man has a close relationship with the Church of Storms, so it's better for him to do it, and there wouldn't be any problems. Audrey suppressed the thought of probing and only curiously asked, Honorable Mr. Fool, what's the title of the King of Angels, Medici? Or should I say, what is his pathway? Klein leaned back into his chair and said with a deep chuckle, Red Priest. Red Priest, which pathway is that? It sounds very similar to the Dark Emperor. Could it be that it's another sequence zero title? Audrey thought with excitement and joy. Red Priest, Derek silently muttered the words, realizing that there was no corresponding record in the City of Silver's history. Perhaps I haven't read enough, having only received a general education. He thought regretfully. Forz and Imlin listened as if they were listening to a story and were equally interested in similar information. The only problem is that I can't brag about it or write it into my novels. Forz felt a pang of regret. Mr. Hangman will likely report it to his superiors. Let's hope he doesn't delay it for too long. With his shrewdness, he may have already figured out some of the problems regarding the world and has grasped the relationship between him and the fool. Fortunately, I have deliberately set up the world to be Sherlock Moriarty since a long time ago, giving him the identity of an adorer. Mr. Hanged Man can at best detect it up to this point, unable to imagine that the world is actually a dummy. Klein raised his hand to his chin, smiled, and said, Continue. Seeing that Mr. Fool was no longer talking about the subject, M. Lin, who had freed himself from his emotions as a messiah, began to face the difficult problems of reality. That was his lack of money. Regardless, he had never considered selling off his dolls. He only told himself that he needed to be frugal in the future. Only after half a year or even a year could he get himself a new doll, or he could buy a new set of clothes for the dolls he already had. In addition, the only way he could think of making money was to sell some potions that had a miraculous effect. But that could easily bring hidden danger to his clansmen in Backlund. This is an arrangement by the ancestor. Logically speaking, Lord Nibs should provide me help, but Mr. Fool wishes for me to keep it a secret, to be the messiah in the shadows who's burdened with responsibility, and not to reveal it on my own accord. After thinking for a few seconds, Emlyn pumped himself up, cleared his throat, and said, Everyone, I have a question. Here's the matter. Suppose there's a powerhouse who has arranged for you to investigate something. Although you have successfully obtained the information, you are unable to report it to the person due to certain reasons. Then, how can you continue to get support from this powerhouse? Having said this, Imlin suddenly felt that this act was somewhat shameful. Th, this makes me appear like a traitor and a spy. No, I'm doing this for the sake of the Sanguine's continuation. For this, I have to give up my reputation and bear the burden of being misunderstood. When this is over, and when the truth is revealed, they'll be moved by me. Emlyn quickly eased his prior feelings. At this moment, Audrey, Fors, and Derek cast their eyes towards Alger. In their eyes, Mr. Hanged Man was the most experienced and the best teacher in this field. Klein also thought so too. Alger glanced at the moon and chuckled. It's simple, but you have to take some risks. Emlyn subconsciously denied, it's not me. The Hanged Man replied with a chuckle, let's assume that it's you. He continued his description. You will slowly display a certain level of abnormalities in your daily life, allowing that powerhouse to see that you have a problem. He will have two choices. One is to interrogate you directly, but it will be very easy to end up losing a lead for clues. The second is to inadvertently provide you with help so that you can investigate more thoroughly and then send people to monitor you. I think the second possibility is the most likely. The risk you have to take is how to not reveal the information you want to hide while under surveillance. That works. In fact, I won't be exposed either. Every tarot gathering, I'll be resting in the Harvest Church, looking normal on the outside. As for the sacrifice of items and the receiving of bestowments, they're things that can be shown to Lord Nibs and the others. It will allow them to guess that I have formed some sort of connection with Mr. Fool, but they can't imagine that I've already joined a secret gathering. Very well. While I'm studying history, I'll take the initiative to ask Baron Waymondy about the City of Silver. Emlyn's eyes lit up as he had an idea. He then thought of something and turned to the hanged man. Last week, didn't you ask about a way to make everyone on board a ship sleep at the same time? It's very simple. I can provide you with a magical anesthetic gas that can effectively spread without any irritating smells. Even on the deck, one will fall unconscious once they catch a whiff of it. Of course, it's best if you choose a windless night, and that the targets are unable to sense danger, and their physiques cannot be too strong. Those Bayonders that are well known for their physiques in Sequence 9 are the limit. 
it can cause deep slumber that lasts for more than three hours. The effects will constantly decline after that. A hundred pounds a can, and an extra thirty pounds for me. The hangman thought about the situation of the sailors on the ghost ship and didn't haggle. Okay, he wanted to erect a certain image in front of the moon, to prepare for the big transaction that would follow. He had thought of using a slumber charm, but that would require him to chant the incantation. It would make the sailors notice that something was wrong and suspect something afterward. At the end of the exchange, Klein tapped the surface of the long, mottled table with his finger, and he said with a leisurely smile, I can foresee that everyone will present a new appearance of themselves next week. Let us end today's gathering here. Thank you for your blessings. Audrey was the first to stand up. She took her leave, expressing her gratitude. With Mr. Fool saying those words, she felt more confident in consuming the psychiatrist's potion. As the magician and the others repeated the same words, one figure after another disappeared from the palace. The area above the gray fog returned to its eternal silence. Chapter 517, City of Generosity, Backland, Sherwood Burrow. As the crimson glow faded from her eyes, Fors saw the familiar desk and open notebook which she used to jot down her inspirations. To her, this experience was no longer anything new, but it still evoked reverence from the bottom of her heart. This was a power that didn't belong to humans, something that even demigods were incapable of. I'll receive the stomach pouch of a spirit eater in two days. My apprentice potion has already been digested. Finally, I'll become a trick master. I wonder what Bayonder powers I'll receive. By advancing by my own abilities, teacher will definitely place greater importance on me. Apart from potion formulas in the future, perhaps I might be provided with some Bayonder ingredients. How I look forward to that very much. I don't even know the corresponding names of sequence 6 and 5. I only know that sequence 7 is astrologer. After I become a trick master, I'll immediately write to teacher. Frizz felt like she was one step closer to ridding herself from the curse of the full moon. At this moment, she heard the sound of hurried footsteps approaching. Finally, it turned into the slam of the door. Zio is out again. She's so busy. For sighed silently. If not for the 400 pounds debt that she owes Viscount Glaint, we would probably be vacationing at Daisy Bay now. After a long period of hard work, and thanks to the enhancement of her strength, certain tasks that were previously impossible for her to complete have become simple. Moreover, from time to time, Zio would receive small tasks that pay well from the Golden Masked Man. Zio has already raised her savings from 110 pounds to 320 pounds, leaving her with only 80 pounds left to pay off her debt. In fact, I could spot her 80 pounds, but unfortunately, although she isn't tall, she still has a lot of pride in her. Frizz withdrew her thoughts and thought about the matter Mr. World had entrusted her. As a doctor and a writer, she didn't know much about radios or anything about the entire field of machinery. She didn't usually pay attention to such information when reading the newspapers, so she didn't know where she could buy the kind of transceiver the world wanted. A department store. It probably doesn't sell one. All right, Avil writes science fiction, so he should know a lot about such matters. Frizz quickly found the right person to consult. However, she immediately had a new problem. Was she to visit him directly, or was she to write him a letter of inquiry? Glancing at the chair covered in a thick, soft blanket, and smelling the fragrance of coffee and tobacco emanating the room, she felt a warmth slowly creeping through her body. Bit by bit, her motivation to leave the house crumbled. I'm not familiar with him, so I shouldn't rashly pay him a visit. She sat down with a grunt and unfolded a piece of paper. In the Berg household in the City of Silver, Derek opened his eyes and woke up from feigning sleep, according to his original plan. He would have immediately held a sacrificial ritual to send out the stomach pouch of the spirit eater. However, the words of the hanged man reminded him to be more cautious and make more observations. Uh, I'll gather the ingredients Mr. Hanged Man require first, and then I'll do the sacrificial ritual all at once. Derek remained silent for a few seconds, then he attached his axe of hurricane to his body and headed for the steeple. He first checked the items available for exchanging using merit points, but he wasn't in a hurry to complete the transaction. He planned to go to the underground market to take a look once the lightning in the sky subsided. Derek went up to the third floor and headed straight for the library section that dealt with mythology and ancient classics, hungering for valuable information he hadn't learned yet. Suddenly, he saw a hard and yellowed book with a cover, Giant King's Court, Book of Blackrock, Hand Copied Edition. It's a record passed down from the Giant King's Court. I wonder if there's anything related to the Kings of Angels. Derek reached for the book, pulled it out, and saw that it was bound in a brown monster hide. At that moment, on the upper level of the library, Colin Iliad was wearing a flaxen-colored linen shirt and a brown coat and standing there quietly, looking down. 
his unkempt grizzled hair flailed in the breeze from the window, and his pale blue eyes were deep and reserved. Wednesday, the 12th of January, 5.40 p.m. The sky was dark and cloudy, with deep blue waves undulating across the sea. The white agate bobbed up and down in this storm, like a toy in the palm of a giant. This is the sea. No matter how powerful one is, one will appear insignificant in front of it. Danit stood by the window and enjoyed the scenery outside. Fortunately, we're almost at the City of Generosity. From the moment they left Banzi Harbor, the White Agate's journey had been smooth sailing. With the help of the wind, it reached a stable speed of 15 knots. Hence, even though they arrived at Tana Port a little later than scheduled, they completed the entire journey half a day earlier. That is to say, the White Agate, which was scheduled to arrive at the City of Generosity on the morning of the 13th, arrived on the evening of the 12th. Hearing Danitz's reflections, Klein just glanced up at him, then looked away and continued his contemplation. The more he played the part of Jame and Sparrow, and the more he had to force himself to behave in accordance with his persona, the more deeply he realized what kind of person he was. When faced with different situations, he realized that the choices he really wanted to make were different from Jam and Sparrow's. For example, he would have responded to Danitz by idly chatting with him about the weather at sea and the disasters caused by those terrible storms. But Jame and Sparrow wouldn't. He had to be cold and reserved. The more there are such differences, the more I recognize myself. Klein sighed inwardly. This was something he hadn't experienced when he moved about with his identity as the private detective, Sherlock Moriarty. Back then, he didn't have to disguise his personality and had just been himself. I feel like I've digested my potion a little. However, Jamin Sparrow has traits that are similar to myself. At the very least, when choosing to disembark and entering Banzi Harbor to save the others, I overlapped with this identity of mine and there was no difference. Of course, it could also be said that I was adding a certain kind of persona into the mix. Beneath Jame and Sparrow's gentleness and madness, he has a kind, brave, and compassionate heart that values relationships. Hey hey, I can't boast about myself. If I had known earlier that Banzi was Binzi, I, I would have most likely been terrified. Not necessarily. At the very least, the danger which was divine was within an acceptable range. Klein thought, summing things up as he engaged in self-deprecation. This made him more aware of a problem. Although playing the role of a purely fictional person could help him digest the potion, he needed to replace an existing identity to speed up and improve his progress. He needed to gain the affirmation of people from the other person's interpersonal relationships, feel the corresponding emotions of joy, anger, sadness, and immersing himself in them, but not getting obsessed. Become anyone, but ultimately become yourself in the end and get feedback from the people involved. Klein looked at the pale yellow carpet, his mind racing. Seeing Jame and Sparrow without a response, Danitz spread his hands helplessly, feeling bored out of his mind. This crazy guy is good in every way other than making me do what servants do. There's only one thing, he doesn't like to talk. There's a communication barrier with him. If this goes on, I'll definitely go crazy. Fortunately, I'm finally at BAM. I can finally be free. Danitz felt that he would sooner or later develop a habit of talking to himself when faced with a similar silence. After a while he saw Jame and Sparrow look up, smile, and say, You can tell me about the pirate point of contacts in Bayam. Dog shit. It's better if you don't say anything. Danitz's expression twisted. Whoosh. At 6.15 p.m., just before the storm arrived, the white agate docked smoothly and arrived at the capital of the Rorsted Archipelago, Bayam, the city of generosity. It was also known as the Spice Archipelago, and it was home to a variety of exotic spices, with the plantations of these produce being mainstays of the economy. The Blue Mountain Island, where Bayam was located, occupied more than half of the archipelago which was mostly covered in forests. It had gold, silver, copper, coal, iron, and other minerals, as well as a plentiful variety of fruits due to the particularly fertile land. For these reasons, the first batch of colonists named the Seaside City they built the City of Generosity. They believed it was a land of treasure promised by the gods, where it flowed with milk and honey. Klein picked up his suitcase which Danitz packed, and he left room 312, entering the corridor that led to the deck. Without any surprises, he met Donna's family, Cleves, and others. The two siblings were still a little afraid of Klein after the fright he gave them. They hid behind their parents and bodyguards and didn't dare to speak, appearing like deflated balloons. Klein nodded slightly as a form of greeting. At this moment, Ertie Branch hesitated for a second and then took a half-step forward. Mr. Sparrow, will you be staying in Bam? 
If I wish to hire, no, request for your help, how can I contact you? He's indeed a businessman with a spirit of adventure. Even if he's afraid, he still wishes to befriend someone with beyonder powers. Klein thought for a moment. What newspapers are in circulation over here? The Sonia Morning Post and the news report are popular in the archipelago, Erdi said without any thought. Put an advertisement in the Sonia Morning Post for three days in a row asking to buy Damir's special cured meat and leave an address. I'll go look for you, and if I don't show up three days later, it means I'm at sea again. Klein was careful to give a one-way method of contact. All right. Erdi exhaled and smiled. Cleves and the others expressed their gratitude once again and left the cabin in an orderly manner. Noticing the gangway in sight, Donna suddenly slowed her pace and stepped back next to Klein, raised her face, and bit her lip. Uncle Sparrow, essence that kind of power definitely brings about threats and madness, W. Why did you choose to have it? She had thought about this question for a long time before finally mustering the courage to ask. Klein was startled, and he instinctively formed a smile. For my dream. Then he lowered his voice and said two words, and protect, protect. Donna mumbled the word in a slightly lost voice, picked up her pace, and caught up with her parents. After watching the Branch family leave the White Agate, Klein retracted his gaze and said to Danitz, you're free. Ah, uh, for a moment, Danitz wasn't used to it. Chapter 518, On the Brink of Death. Without another word or care for Danitz, Klein pressed his top hat and carried his suitcase down the gangway. Are you really going to let me go? Blazing Danitz stood on the deck, his face filled with suspicion. Although he had expected such an outcome, with Jame and Sparrow directly letting him go while in Damir Harbor, making him capable of imagining today's scene, he still couldn't believe it. He felt that everything that befell him came too simply and easily. Regardless, I'm worth 3,000 pounds. No, this is the bounty offered only by loan. Isn't this madman, Jamin Sparrow, an adventurer? How can he let go of a huge amount of wealth in front of him? It's incomprehensible. Heh. It's true that normal people can't understand the mindset of lunatics. Danitz gradually snapped back to his senses. With his luggage in hand, he carefully descended the gangway and stepped onto the concrete ground of the dock. He straightened his back, lifted his head, and gave Jamin Sparrow's back a glance. He realized that he really wasn't turning back and was following the path straight for Coastal Street. Danitz didn't dare delay a second longer. He immediately turned around and left through another path, occasionally changing directions and using obstacles to look back, in order to ensure that he wasn't followed. Soon, he arrived at a row of houses near the warehouse at the dock. Jam and Sparrow really didn't use me as bait. After triple-checking, Danitz finally relaxed completely. At this moment, he finally felt like he was liberated. A dignified boatswain of a pirate admiral like him no longer had to be bullied and be ordered around like a servant. I can already foresee that tomorrow will be incomparably beautiful. There will be a group of people vying to flatter me, wanting to become my servants. Danitz knocked happily on the door, three long and three short, rhythmically. Hee <laughs> hee, Jamin Sparrow asked me to give him the pirate point of contacts in Bayam. I obviously only told him the ones that don't have a good relationship with us. There's no way he could guess that our golden dream point of contact is right at the dock. Danitz picked at his nose and breathed in the fresh sea breeze before a looming rain. Bayam was a pivotal location of the Lone Kingdom's Sonia Sea Colonies. It was one of the largest cities in the region. There were many powerful official Bayonders, and no matter how rampant the pirates were, they didn't dare to openly show their faces here. Most of the time, they had to rely on the local gangs or people with backgrounds to handle the loot and purchase any necessities. Of course, this didn't mean that they wouldn't come to Bayam. The Red Theater here was the most famous brothel in the surrounding seas, and countless pirates came to patronize this famous place. Even if one or two of their peers were caught every once in a while, it didn't stop them from rushing over. In addition to the spice trade, the brothel industry was another major pillar of the Rorsted Archipelago. Apart from the Red Theater, there were many big or small brothels, out in the open or hidden all over the place. They fully satisfied the desires of the seamen with ample energy. As for the female pirates, they didn't have to worry about this problem. As long as they were willing, they could always be satisfied. After all, there was more demand than supply. At sea, where faith in the Lord of Storms was mainstream, there had always been few females. Similarly, the underground trade related to beyonder ingredients and mysticism was quite frequent here and there were many circles. Those smaller ports are still better. We don't have to be afraid of being discovered at all, and we can just openly sit in a bar, engage in disputes with adventurers, and even fight them. As long as we don't cause any trouble or cause any deaths, the local official Bayonders will turn a blind eye. 
Yeah. With their strength, they typically have to take on tremendous risks if they wish to interfere. Danitz thought mockingly. At that moment, he heard footsteps and saw the door creak open. A familiar face entered his sight. Old man, did you not drink today? Danitz smiled and greeted. Standing at the door was one of the Golden Dreams contacts in the Rorsted Archipelago, Old Rin. Old Rin coughed twice and made way. Danitz stepped into the dim room, his nose twitching suddenly. He caught a whiff of Lanty proof. Though, Old Rin likes to drink locally produced Bay and Black Rand. As this thought flashed through his mind, Danitz was terrified. Immediately following that, he saw a man with his back to him rise to his feet. He was tall, dark, and muscular, and his hair was curled like marbles. Steel Mavetti. Danitz's pupils contracted sharply. This was the second mate of the Admiral of Blood, a great pirate with a bounty of 6,000 pounds. Waves of the sea breeze blew, swaying the thin, sharp leaves of the tree in a precarious manner. Klein was walking along Coastal Street at an adequate speed. In contrast, the people around him were hurrying and walking quickly. His spiritual intuition told him that it would take some time before the storm would arrive, and that he had plenty of time to find a hotel. Whoosh! The sound of the wind grew louder and louder. Tree branches fell to the ground, and there weren't many people left on the street. Klein was about to turn into another alley when he heard the sound of hasty but disorderly running. Tap, tap, tap. Danitz was running with all his might, but the scene in front of him began to rock. He felt an abnormal pain from his wound as he felt his vitality rapidly sapping away. His spirit body had partially left his body, approaching the legendary underworld. As for the surrounding sounds, he could only vaguely hear them, and everything in his line of sight looked like it wasn't real. If it wasn't for having Shadow Cloak, the ambush would have killed him. But even so, he was still severely injured and could die on the streets at any moment. He was forced to run towards Coastal Street because of his will to warn the captain that their point of contact had been compromised by the Admiral of Blood, as well as the glimmer of hope brought by that crazy but powerful figure. If it's him, then he would definitely be able to escape from the hands of Steel Mavetti's henchmen. Danitz began to stagger, and his body gradually grew cold. Just as he was about to collapse, he saw Jamin Sparrow standing by a street corner. His refined face that hid madness appeared so genial at that moment. Plop! Danitz fell on his back, his hands hanging limply over his chest, revealing a hideous, exaggerated wound that was inflicted to his organs. Tell Captain that old Rin has been discovered. Steel Mavetti did it for that treasure. Danitz saw Jamin Sparrow kneel to his side as he hurriedly spoke. Klein recalled the bounty offered for Steel Mavetti and asked in return, Admiral of Blood. Yes, tell Captain. T tell Captain. Danitz gasped as he said. After saying all that, he revealed a mournful smile. Don't worry about me. I'm about to die soon. Tell the captain that all the money I've saved up has been turned into real estate. Units 12 to 16 on Bayam's Amorous Avenue. The title deeds are hidden in the wall of Unit 13 Seconds Basement. H help me sell them. T take the money to South in Tiz's Elema Town. G give the money to my parents. S say that I've really made a fortune. Danitz paused. Then he said with great difficulty, S say that I've become an out outstanding adventurer. Also, help me S say I'm sorry. His eyes suddenly became moist, as if he was recalling that rebellious youth from back then. I'm sorry, old man, mother. I'm unable to return home. Danitz's vision darkened, and he felt that his life was coming to an end. It was at this moment that he saw Jamin Sparrow reach out and press his hand to his wound and then swipe it. Danitz's sorrow came to a sudden halt as he felt the already numb pain in his chest and abdomen suddenly disappear as his left hand seemed to suffer a fracture. He looked at Klein blankly, and Klein looked back at him quietly. None of them spoke for two seconds. Finally, he looked down in astonishment and discovered that his lethal wound had strangely healed. His left arm was badly mutilated, and even his bones protruded out. I am fine now. Danitz blinked, still immersed in the sadness and frustration of his brush with death. Why didn't you treat me first? He asked blankly. Klein looked back at the empty area on the other side of Coastal Street and said in a calm tone, waiting for you to finish. That's basic courtesy. Courtesy, you son of a BTCH. I was really saying my last words. With a sudden jerk of his back, Danitz rolled to his feet. He warily looked towards the dock, where a thick cloud of smoke was rising. It was none other than the result of the battle he had just been engaged in. Because the house was set on fire by me, Steel Mavetti was afraid that it would catch the attention of the official Bayonders. As he was confused by that shadow, he didn't chase after me. Danitz instantly understood the sequence of events. Let's find a place to stay first. Klein spread his hands and caught a drop of rain. Not knowing whether or not he had completely escaped danger, Danitz immediately nodded. Okay, I can tell that this madman, Jamin Sparrow, isn't afraid of Steel Mavetti at all. 
he's not even afraid of Admiral of Blood. At such times, I especially admire his craziness. Damn, I exposed my wealth to him. Danitz had just exhaled when his body froze. Klein walked silently ahead with his suitcase and Kane with only one thought echoing in his head. God emit, a pirate is richer than I am. Empress Burrow, Audrey, who was about to leave Backland, hid in her chemistry laboratory and concocted the psychiatrist's potion with the ingredients she received from Mr. Vampire, the fruit of the Tree of Elders, the blood of a mirror dragon, and the other ingredients she had collected previously. This time, she didn't get Susie to guard the door. Instead, she was to sit inside and observe the whole process from the sidelines. Earl Hall had already instructed everyone to not approach the young lady during her experiments, but they had to pay attention to any unusual changes. Phew, Audrey let out a small sigh of relief, pouring the completed potion into a prepared glass bottle. The slightly golden liquid rippled like a deformed, gigantic pupil. Its gaze seemed to shine right into the eyes of anyone's heart. Susie, did you remember the process? You are a mature, no, you are a mature Bayonder. In the future, you'll have to learn how to concoct your own potion. No, it's not that I'm not helping you, it's just that I'm pointing out a possibility. Sometimes, I might not be by your side, and you just happen to need a potion bottle. Audrey said happily to the huge golden retriever. Susie was so confused by what she was taught and she could only open her mouth to reply with a single word, woof. Converging her emotions, Audrey raised her head and downed the psychiatrist's potion bottle. Chapter 519, Naming The golden liquid was cool and refreshing, making Audrey feel as if she was enjoying a delicious ice cream. She then took a sip of champagne. Tiny bubbles of air continuously rose, silently bursting as they brought a tingling sensation with them. Suddenly, her sense of hearing reached out, and she could hear the conversation of the two maids at the end of the corridor as they lamented at how they had no chance of going to the Hall family's castle and manor in East Chester County. At this moment, Audrey felt as if she had dissolved into an illusory gas and was rapidly expanding. It filled the entire room, overlapping with a sea formed from everyone's sea of consciousness. Her vision also changed. Everything she saw was abnormally smooth, turning into a mirror that reflected her current appearance, possessing a beauty described by pure, Exquisite, grand, and witty, golden scales that were slowly growing out of her exposed skin. Her emerald green irises contracted and were dyed in a faint golden color, as if they had turned vertical. Audrey suddenly felt fear from the bottom of her heart when she saw herself like this. She didn't want or wish to become an inhuman monster. With a hum, her mind began to turn into a blur, as if something was slowly and painfully drilling out from the surface of her body. Just then, she heard the gentle voice of her huge golden retriever, Susie. Don't be afraid, calm down. Don't be afraid, calm down. Audrey recovered her thoughts and tried to get herself into a spectator state. Her undulating emotions quickly calmed down, and her spirit seemed to leave her body. She then looked down at herself like a spectator. Audrey saw the golden scales on the surface of her body visibly recede and her emerald-like eyes return to normal. It didn't take her long to regain control of her body and understand what Beyonder powers were available to a psychiatrist and how they were used. I it was so dangerous just now. Audrey raised her hand in fear. Her skin was fair and delicate, completely unlike the abnormal condition she had been in a moment ago. After this incident, she truly understood how terrifying the danger of losing control which Mr. Fool would occasionally bring up was. She gained a deep understanding of how difficult it was to go down the Beyonder path. Even with the acting method, it was impossible to completely remove the latent risks. At one gathering, Mr. World said that Bayonders are a bunch of miserable wretches that are constantly fighting against threats and madness. Previously, I could only understand it literally. Now, I can finally feel the weight behind this sentence. Audrey, don't be discouraged, don't be afraid. Father, mother, and brother are still waiting for your protection. With this experience, you won't be frightened by yourself in the future or so easily lose control. You can do it. Audrey clenched her fists and encouraged herself. She calmed down for two seconds, walked up to Susie, squatted down, and hugged the golden retriever. As she combed its fur, she put her head against the side of the dog's face and muttered in its warmth, Thank you, thank you. Susie rubbed against her twice and asked seriously, Audrey, is this how a psychiatrist feels like? I like it very much. Audrey was suddenly at a loss on whether to laugh or cry. She immediately pursed her lips and promised, Susie, we'll treat each other in the future. Yes, psychological problems. Okay, woof. Susie answered happily. It was only now with Audrey truly recovering that she was in the mood to examine her own advancement. My body seems to have become healthier. Although I don't have any obvious muscles, my strength and speed have become much stronger than before. My eyesight has also improved. 
I can even clearly see items hidden in the dark. My sense of smell is able to distinguish even more subtle smells, and thus being able to grasp a target's truest emotions and thoughts. I finally have Bayonder powers in the truest sense of the word. Yes, there's also awe. I can target a single person or apply it to a group of people within a certain range. They'll instantly panic and turn chaotic as though they're facing a dragon. Another is frenzy. It will trigger the emotions and mental state of a target, throwing the target into a frenzy. They'll suffer intense psychological damage and might even cause direct loss of control at times. Another is psychological cue. Through specific methods, words, and a medium, I can cue a target, letting them abide by my arrangements without them realizing it. Or they might strongly abide by a particular promise from the bottom of their hearts. Another is placate, also known as psychoanalysis. I can help Bayonders on the brink of losing control to regain their reason and escape danger. There's a certain chance of failure. The higher my sequence, the more easily it will succeed. It can calm down various psychological instabilities and allow for communication. Another is telepathy. Through mediums like candlelight and extracts, it will put the target in a partially hypnotic state. I'll then be able to directly communicate with their body of heart and mind, just like what Hilbert Alucard did to me. If not for the protection provided by Mr. Fool's Angel, then I wouldn't have the means to lie under such situations. Yes, I have to be on guard against such techniques. I can't be fooled by a target, and there should be quite a number of means to achieve this effect. With placate and telepathy, together with certain psychology knowledge, I'll be able to act as a true psychiatrist, the kind that can open a clinic. Audrey's mood rapidly improved. She finally had the feeling that she had matured and become a qualified Bayonder. I'm a mid-sequence Bayonder. There really is a qualitative change. She stood up, lifted her skirt, and walked briskly around in a circle. She quickly discovered that she was still lacking in direct offensive abilities as a psychiatrist. Fortunately, I have this. Audrey stopped in front of the experiment table and opened a plain brown box. Inside the box was a silver mask that could only cover half a face. It was the mystical item that the hanged man had sold her. Audrey picked it up, placed it in her palm, and observed it for a few seconds. Then, she extended her spirituality and projected her thoughts just like how she did above the gray fog. She saw the silver mask begin to warp inwards, turning into a hollow, finely patterned slightly large earring. It might be better to turn it into a necklace, Audrey whispered. Afterward, she tried out the various abilities of this magical item. She was most satisfied with her ability to fine-tune her appearance. It's a pity that other than flame controlling, it doesn't have any other more direct offensive powers. Perhaps I'll need to prepare a revolver, one that has Bayonder effects. Audrey thought with some regret. She quickly collected her emotions and said to the mystical item in her hand with an uplifted tone towards the end, From today, your name is Lai. The most beautiful lie. City of Generosity, Bayam. 48 Acid Lemon Street, Wind of Azure Inn. It was raining heavily outside and the wind was raging, but inside the luxurious suite, the fireplace was warm and the environment peaceful. Klein sat in his chair and watched silently as Blazing Danitz dealt with the severe fracture on his left arm. He waited until Danitz was finished binding up his arm with shredded, old clothes before asking bluntly, what treasure? According to Danitz, it was because of some treasure that Admiral of Blood Center wanted to deal with Vice Admiral Edwina Edwards. The sound of wind and rain came through the window. Danitz took a sip of the lanty proof on the table and then gave a bitter, angry laugh. Those are holes who had their brains eaten by zombies. On our last expedition, we found a sunken ship. Although we didn't find anything of great value, we discovered a gigantic black iron key that doesn't look like the kind used by humans. Can you imagine? After being submerged under the sea for so many years, it hasn't rusted at all. Yes, Klein replied in a concise manner. In a world where extraordinariness and mystery intertwined, what wasn't possible? There were people who could be resurrected from the dead, not to mention others. Danitz choked and paused for seven or eight seconds before he knew what to say next. Perhaps there's a traitor among us, and the news has spread. Countless pirates believe that this is Death's Key, a key that can open the treasure trove Death left behind. I thought that this problem would be cleared up very quickly and happily applied for a vacation. In the end, the matter became more complicated. Even Admiral of Blood has joined the ranks of these mad pirates. I'm even beginning to suspect that it's Death's Key, a key that can turn one into a true god. Foolish, Klein calmly gave his evaluation. Whether it was in the divination domain or dealing with deities, he could be considered experienced. Thus, he had his own understanding and confidence in the interpretation of Death's Key. He believed that the key was a form of revelation, a symbol. 
The thing that opened Death's treasure trove was probably not in the shape of a key, but some kind of characteristic, bloodline, or even certain, specified people and their descendants. Danitz was startled for two seconds, and then he exclaimed, Your words are exactly the same as Captain's previous comments, and even your expressions are very similar. She suspects that the key belongs to an older era, an era not of humans. Before the cataclysm, this world was still full of giants, dragons, elves, and demonic wolves. The shape of the key indirectly points to one of them. Demonic wolves. Klein suddenly recalled the ravings he often heard during his past advancements. In it, the phlegria he heard referred to the ancient god, Annihilation Demonic Wolf, a treasure that involves the second epoch. He held back his curiosity and switched to calmly saying, Write down everything that Admiral of Blood has done, including Steel Mavetti and his men. He remembered that Admiral of Blood and his pirate crew were the most notorious groups on the ocean. Their hands were stained with blood as they committed heinous sins. How can I remember? They aren't beauties like Captain. Danitz threw up his hands. I can only list the most important things and some of the details that have left an impression on me. Wait, what do you want to do? Bit by bit, Klein revealed a smile, one that gave Danitz a fright. He said in a deep voice, if it's appropriate, I want to hunt them. 